Okay. Uh, so we're, I'm going to start with a couple of videos to set the scene. So I'm going to have a couple TV shows present for me for, for a few minutes, and then I will start talking about uh, SIPA. But let's start with, is this Scrubs or what, what the hell show is this? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa. That's some mean looking bruises, you know that? What you got drawn to? Nothing big, I fell off my bike. Those staples? What the hell? Did they do this to you? No. No. Who did this to you? I did. I didn't want to go to the doctor again, so I just stapled it. It's no biggie. You stapled your own arm. Can you please just ditch up my legs so we can get out of here? You're not going anywhere with those people, Megan. They're never going to lay a hand on you again. They didn't do anything. Please, they're my best parents I've ever had. Megan. They don't hurt me. I can't be hurt. No, believe me. Punch me in the stomach right now. The staples are in there pretty deep. I'm going to have to get a shot to I don't need a shot. Trust me, you want a shot. It's swollen. It's gonna hurt like a. There. Can I go now? I didn't even hurt. superpower is that um, her mouth moves so differently from the audio that, uh, that is emitted from it. Um, so that's the first example of SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. We'll talk about the anhydrosis part in just a minute. Um, but House, I do know which show this one is, although I think this is like a German preview. Um, but here it is. <laughs> Doctor risk to serve their patients. This is excellent. That's right. Palace. Doctor's palace. <laughs> that's why I assume it's like German or, or something. I mean, it's obviously in English, but that's not the English spelling. So again, um, sort of a, a Hollywood equivalent of SIPA. The patient has SIPA. It's rare. Uh, but it does exist and it makes for a compelling story in a medical drama. And the first one was again, Grey's Anatomy <laughs> and then in house. But so here's a, a news story uh, about the same condition. There are many rare diseases in the world. A 12 year old girl, Ashlyn Blocker suffers from an exceptionally bizarre genetic disorder and has a congenital insensitivity to pain. Simply put, she can feel absolutely no pain whatsoever. The disorder is very dangerous because the inability to feel pain means that sufferers may not recognize a potentially deadly problem as the warning signs cannot be felt. As an infant, Ashlyn never cried. Then, at eight months, her parent took her to the doctor for an irritated eye. Medical staff noticed that she had a corneal abrasion which should have been very painful. That visit led to multiple tests and almost two years later they received a diagnosis. To this day, Ashlyn will still sometimes stick her hand in a pot of boiling water to fish out a dropped utensil, forgetting that it will cause her skin to burn even though she won't feel it. Surfing as an inspiration, Ashlyn and her family have started Camp Painless But Hopeful, a camp designated to raise awareness and help families living with congenital insensitivity to pain. So we have nociceptors, right? Nociceptors are our pain fibers. Uh, we have a lot of uh, sensory fibers, afferents, right? We receive sensory input. Not all of those fibers are uh, pain fibers. Um, we have C fibers and we have uh, A delta. I'll talk about those specifically in just a second, but those are the nociceptors, the pain fibers, the sensory fibers that relay information of ouch as opposed to proprioception, you know how you can touch your nose behind your mask with your eyes closed? Like if the mask were over your eyes, you can still touch your nose, um, you know, unless you're drunk. And you can do all those other things if you're sober, you know, walking a lot without looking, going up a flight of stairs, without looking at where your feet are. If someone taps you on the shoulder, 
you can feel that and it doesn't hurt. Maybe if you have a terrible sunburn or something, but it doesn't hurt. So you have these A alpha, you have A beta nerves, you have sensory nerves that don't relay messages of pain. And then you have pain fibers. You have nociceptors, pain fibers. When those things depolarize, they send signals of pain. And this has been observed for a long time, studied, briefer, observed for a really long time. You know, first described in 1846, but people didn't really start to figure out what was going on or even characterize it effectively until pretty far into the 20th century. And it does go by multiple names. Um, so SIFA is a common name, right? Congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis and like non-hydrosis sweating. You don't sweat with this. Or uh, hereditary sensory and autonomic uh, neuropathy type four. There are multiple types, type four and type five. We'll talk about both of these today. But there's a lot of complications um, with SIPA. I'm just gonna call it SIPA, um, but you'll see it does go by both names in the literature. SIPA is the common one. Just like I talk about PKB and AKT, PKB is, I don't know which one's more common now. AKT has been more prevalent in the literature, but PKB is a better name despite uh, prevalence in the literature. SIPA is more prevalent, but, but you will see this uh, as well. Um, but recurrent episodic fevers, anhydrosis, absence of reaction to painful stimuli, the girl whose hand goes in the water, in the boiling water and doesn't notice it, you know, pulling out the sta uh, staples because she's a superhero or whatever. Um, and then with the self-mutilating behavior, not on purpose, but people don't, if you don't feel pain, I mean, look at people's mouths and stuff, and they have these chipped teeth, they're biting through their lips on accident. You know, pain serves a purpose. Pain is there for a reason. Pain influences our decisions, our behaviors to uh, prolong our survival. And so here is a look at these different nerve fiber types. Again, we have A alphas, we have A betas. Those things are very thickly myelinated. A alphas and A betas have really thick myelin on them. And the nerve conduction velocity of those things is like a racing Ferrari of A alphas, A betas. I mean, those things are on, you know, the Autobahn. Now, A delta, thinly myelinated very thinly myelinated it goes I don't know, who won the 100 meter dash in the olympics this year nobody knows because usain bolt is the last memorable name because like if you don't break the world record nobody knows your name like oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like you might as well be like 10th place so whoever won gold this year you know, running at about the speed, top speed of that is roughly equivalent to how fast the nerve conduction velocity of an A-delta is. C-fibers don't have myelin. So here's the nerve conduction velocity of a C-fiber. It drags its feet. It doesn't go very fast. Now, we have two different sensations of pain, and you've all felt it. A bee sting or somebody, there's like somebody is like stabbing you with something or some sharp pain, some acute Sharp, immediate, potent pain, A delta. Sharp, immediate pain. A C fiber is slow, lingering pain. That is the injury that's just, ah, oh, you know, it's just achy. It's just achy or like your stomach or whatever. These, these uh, stimuli take a little while to set in. They linger, they're obnoxious, they don't go away and they ache. This is sharper, this is more painful, but we don't actually care quite as much about those because these ones tend to linger. But both of these fiber types are going to disappear in SIPA, congenital insensitivity to pain. So from this article, I'll post these articles. Um, so since patients with congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis lack nerve growth factor, NGF, nerve growth factor, we've talked all about cell signaling for a bunch of lectures. And we have these uh, factors are just proteins. And you know, insulin-like growth factor, that's a protein that's going to signal anabolic cascades. Nerve growth factor, very similar. Um, so unmyelinated C fibers and thinly myelinated A delta fibers 
uh, and their dermal sweat glands are without innervation. So when you see this anhydrosis, we do not have innervation of the sweat glands. So there's, there's an amount of heat that can get generated. And for those who are in stress phys, you know we're the naked ape, right? We, we, we are not covered in fur. We're wonderful sweaters. When you look at the animal kingdom and our ability to dissipate heat, all this surface area and sweat just coming out of everywhere, our ability to dissipate heat puts us as one of the most elite endurance athletes out of the whole animal kingdom. We're terrible sprinters. We love sprinting because who knows anyone who's ever won a gold medal in the marathon? No, nobody cares. Now it's a great event, but that's what we're good at. We can be horses in the marathon. Humans can be horses in the marathon. We can just go to the zoo and just point at something. And unless you're at some like, like a penguin or whatever, you're losing that race if it's a sprint. For a marathon, we're really good. And that sweating is really how, how we do it, but not with SEPA. If you have SEPA, that isn't going to happen. Now, again, pain, critical to the regulation of our behaviors. That hurts, so I won't do it, right? That hurts, so I won't do it. That's super uncomfortable, so I won't do it. This um, loss and pain uh, motivating our behaviors is critical to self-preservation, to our ongoing uh, survival. And without pain, we don't have as much information about what is good for us and what is bad for us. In particular, uh, what is bad for us. Now, nerve growth factor is pro-nociceptive. Nerve growth factor is a uh, stimulatory for nociception, for pain uh, reception. But also, we're looking at things like neuronal sprouting at the site of injury, nerve health, nociception, yes, but the nerve health, sec not even just secondarily, as, as just as primarily. But we have mutations, right? Mutations in the gene for nerve growth factor or its receptor, uh, tropomyosin receptor kinase A uh, or receptor tyrosine kinase. You'll see it as both in the literature, AKT versus PKB. Um, tropomyosin receptor kinase A or receptor tyrosine kinase. This is the receptor that nerve growth factor binds to on a cell surface, on a nerve cell surface, and it initiates a cell signaling cascade. You can get mutations in either nerve growth factor, that protein. Remember, proteins do everything in the body or the receptor. Receptors are proteins too. You can get a, uh, a mutation in that. Uh, again, this is SEPA, the four sort of classic SEPA, is associated with mutations, mostly nonsense SNPs, not nonsense mutations, but also missense, um, small insertions and deletions, um, and then the splicing variants, we didn't talk about that, um, where intron meets exon, you, you ignore that one. But there's a lot of different uh, mutations that can arise uh, for SEPA. Um, in the gene coding for tropomyosin receptor kinase A, that's what four is. And then five um, is caused by mutations in the nerve growth factor uh, beta gene. So we're looking at both mutations in the uh, molecule, the signaling molecule and the receptor that it binds to. Now cell signaling should be familiar to you. Cell signaling should be familiar. Um, here's tropomyosin receptor kinase A and uh, that's it's called track a um trka but it, it's pronounced track a there's a track b and we're going to talk about that uh bdnf brain derived neurotrophic factor binds to track b but you'll see both uh mapk and pkb mtor pkb and mapk signaling downstream from track a so you know this type of signaling it's not just skeletal muscle that is responsive to mTOR signaling. Get into any tissue in the body and you're going to start seeing these same signaling cascades. You're going to start seeing all of this hyper, uh, hypertrophy, the hypertrophic signaling you've been talking about being responsible for the management of other tissues as well. 
the metabolism, the balance between catabolism and anabolism, uh, the preservation, the growth of all of these other tissues. And as we move into the brain, that's the next topic, is exercise and cognitive health, exercise and neuronal health, uh, nerve growth factor, track B uh, for BDNF, track A for nerve growth factor, those are huge, those are huge topics. And this is probably what Travis Stiles is going to talk about in the next lecture, Friday's lecture, um, is a lot of track A, track B signaling. This is what he researches. Um, and so looking at, at you know, the, at the C fibers and the A delta fibers, um, the genes encoding them. Now, there are a lot of mutations that can arise. It's rare-ish, it's pretty rare. Um, but more than 50 track A mutations by the cause SEPA have been described. And as all of you have been talking about in your presentations, some are more common than others. Some are super rare, some are a little bit more abundant. Um, but for track A, this is classically what SEPA is, is the receptor itself gets mutated. Uh, missense mutations uh, affect the kinase domain. So kinase, remember, we have different kinds of, of enzymes. And a kinase attaches phosphates to things. And so to initiate that signaling cascade, it's a phosphorylation cascade. You, you need kinase activity. And so we typically see these missense mutations affecting the kinase uh, activity. But there are nonsense mutations as well. There are frame shift mutations uh, with track A. Uh, but uh, different mutations are going to elicit different actions, different folding of the protein, different behavior of that protein because it was folded differently. And so there's not just one presentation of SIPA. There are lots of presentations of SIPA, some more extreme than others. Some patients don't have the cognitive deficits that other patients have. It depends on the mutation of how severe it gets. So I said Travis Stiles is going to be presenting on Friday. We're just gonna we're going to uh, zoom him in either on the big TV uh, that would probably be a clearer picture or on this screen, and I'll rig up the camera in a way that maybe he can see us and we can respond, we can engage. There's a there's a microphone aimed at, at all of us, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer questions along the way at the end. He loves talking about this stuff, but uh, we did our undergrad and our master's together. Then he went down to UC San Diego um, to do his PhD, really focused on neuroscience. Um, it was in uh, biomedical science is the name of his degree, but looking on uh, at neuroscience. And he discovered during his PhD, uh, he's the one who discovered this novel pathway of, of cell signaling. Uh, for regeneration of neuronal tissue. And so what does that apply to? Regeneration of neuronal tissue. You're looking at MS, looking at Alzheimer's, you're look, looking at uh, brain injury, you're looking at strokes. There's all of these conditions for which medicine is, young would be a euphemism. Medicine is horribly inadequate to cope with these conditions. All we really do is pat people on the back and say, they're there. I am there for you. And other expressions of there in a compassionate way. That's really all we can do. What we need to be able to do is regrow this tissue. And so that's what he's studying. Um, he founded Novaron Bioscience in 2014. And uh, now it's operating in two states. It's in California. And then uh, that's Missouri, I think is, is the other state. This is the original article he published in 2013, submitted in 2012. It was published in 2013, looking uh, at this signaling uh, and myelin. Uh, and I'll, I will upload this article uh, later today. I'll, I'll get this article uploaded. But this is a nice transition from what we've been talking about, cell signaling and uh, gene mutations and then looking at clinical applications, applying that information in clinical settings, in uh, conditions for which medicine has nothing but compassion and even does a bad job there. What we want is a cure, we want a treatment. Uh, we want to uh, improve our condition 
and we don't have that. But this is a potential pathway to make progress in that direction. So Travis will be talking on Friday and then on Monday, I, I keep delaying this one, but on Monday, uh, we will talk about aging and the genome and uh, getting into geriatrics and, and how decay, uh, what it looks like inside, not just like, oh, you're wrinkly and gray. Oh, that's not interesting, right? What is happening genetically, physiologically that, that brings about gray and wrinkly conditions? So we'll get into that. And then the exercise genomics of what kind of intervention do we have to address that? that that's it for today. It's a short one. Oh, yeah, I'll take, I'll take applause. I have one, one person clap twice. Yeah. That was a loud one. <laughs>